Hey everyone, welcome back to my long-awaited round six recap video of the Gibraltar Battle of the Sexes tournament. I know it's been a while, but I'm excited to share this game, especially with you guys. And if you're wondering what took so long, I did make an update video, which you can watch here. But let's get into this game. In this round, I played Grandmaster Marie Sabag from France, and uh, it's probably one of the most interesting games I played in the whole tournament. And it started with a London opening. Um, now, if you've been following the recaps closely, in my first two games with the white pieces, I played pawn e4 on the first move. Uh, one game against Jovanko Hauska going, uh, going into Karo Khan and against Giria going into e4, e5. But I decided to uh, kind of reunite with one of my favorite openings in this game. And I know people have kind of a, a negative impression of the London opening. They think it's boring. They think it's dry. But as we're going to see in this game, at a higher level, there's a lot of interesting possibilities. Theory is still evolving. And from a very early position, things got really, really sharp. So we entered uh, one of the main lines after c5, e3, knights develop. And uh, after knight bd2, this is uh, one of like the main kind of early critical positions where black has a bunch of options. Uh, queen b6 is a move, cd4, e6, bishop f5, and bishop g4. A lot of playable moves for black. Um, in this game, my opponent played knight to h5, which is also a playable move. It's, uh, it's one of the more trendy lines in top level play these days. And I will admit that I wasn't specifically prepared for this move before the game. Um, I was looking at a variety of things she could play, but uh, as far as I know, this is her first time playing this move in a, a serious game. And uh, the one thing I knew about this position is that the engines usually prefer DC5. So I played this move relatively quickly. Uh, she took, I took... And we reach a position where white has conceded the bishop pair, black has uh, the two bishops, and white has some slightly compromised pawn structure. At the same time, white is temporarily up a pawn because uh, black has not recaptured on c5, and white also has a slight lean development. So there's some interesting imbalances already. And she played the move queen to a5, which is one of the main lines. And in this position, I had a, a decision to make, and I was out of any sort of specific preparation at this point, but I knew uh, one of the basic strategies here is to play in a more positional style with something like bishop d3 and castling and c3, let black regain the pawn and kind of go into a middle game where white has relatively good peace harmony. It turns out that after the game, I found out that uh, none other than Magnus Carlsen had this position with the white pieces against Fabiano Caruana. They played a game in 2020 that Magnus won in beautiful, beautiful fashion. And I don't want to go on too much of a tangent to show that game in this video. But if you guys do want to see the game, uh, maybe I'll feature it in a, an upcoming video. And actually... Let's make a challenge. If this video gets 3,000 likes, I'll share the game in which Carlson crushed Caruana in the London opening featuring this variation. Um, so that's one possibility for white, but another possibility which I was very intrigued in uh, over the board was to go for the move pawn c4. And this is a move I did end up playing. And this move is a little bit counterintuitive because usually when the opponent has a bishop pair, you don't want to be opening up the position. At the same time, because I have a lean development, it's still going to take black another move to regain the pawn. I figured that opening the position could go in my favor, if, uh, especially if black is slow to castle. So I played this move. She took the pawn. And then I played uh, a move which is almost a novelty. There's only been one game featuring this move, uh, at least in the Masters database, is pawn to b4. So already by move nine, we have almost a completely new position. And at first it looks like b4 
just doesn't work because there's two things that can take it and it's not defended by anything. But the whole point is to get initiative and, and to continually throw punches and, and make threats against uh, black setup. Uh, and the point here is that if knight takes b4, which was played in the game, I can very simply play a3. And if the knight moves back to c6, I can play knight to b3, uh, not only hitting the queen, but unleashing my queen, hitting the pawn on d5. And if queen d6, pawn takes d5, this would be a really, really good position for white. Um, in the game, she played knight to a6, which we'll get to. I do want to quickly show, though, if uh, if queen takes b4, uh, I'd very simply have c takes d5, and there's no good square this knight can move to. Uh, probably has to retreat to like very ugly square. If it moves to d4, then a uh, move like rook b1, and black's, uh, black's under serious, serious pressure here. Queen c5, queen a4, white's winning a piece. So, um, so yeah, I played b4. Uh, she took a lot of time and uh, and took with the knight. I played a3, and she retreated to a6. And already I was feeling really, really good. It was a London opening, but very fresh position. And even though I am temporarily... Am I down a pawn here? One, two, three... Yeah, I'm down a pawn. So even though I'm down a pawn, I have lots of ways to still get initiative. And the move I played here was uh, was very ambitious, was knight to e5. Uh, the point being to control these two squares and threaten the very deadly queen a4 check. In hindsight, I probably should have taken. Um, I, I did some analysis after the game. It turns out if I take, the engine is already giving plus 1.5 for white, very close to just decisive advantage. And here the point is, if queen takes d5, I have bishop to c4, developing with tempo, I'll castle very soon, and uh, white has more than enough compensation for being down a pawn. Um, but I played knight e5, thinking that things are, are still very much going in my favor. Uh, she moved to a5 with the queen, so preventing queen a4, also pinning my knight. I took on d5, and here she played pawn g6. So it's black strategy to try and develop and castle as quickly as possible. So I essentially know what she wants to do the next two moves, and it's up to me to try and stop it. So here I started with a move queen to b3, which is multi-purpose. Uh, first of all, it does prepare bishop b5 check, which is a deadly threat. Additionally, it aligns with f7 pawn, and I have ideas of uh, playing pawn d6, really trying to bust open the center and punish Black's king uh, before it can castle. So she played bishop g7, and I figured that bishop b5 isn't so deadly because she has king f8, and uh, Black actually finds some safety, and it's my king who is a bit stuck in the center, tied down to the knight, which is pinned. So I decided to play pawn d6 here, baking things really, really crazy. Um, now, of course, I am threatening f7, I'm threatening to take on e7. At the same time, I am allowing the queen to have some scope against the knight on e5. And I was very well aware that she can take, and I can't take back because of queen takes e5, and I'm going to be losing a rook. So when I played d6, I saw this position and saw I have a nice in-between move, is to throw in bishop to b5 check, obstructing the queen from covering e5. And after king f8, I can safely take back on e5. Now, I do want to point out a funny line here. There's a calculation during the game um, I was making is if black plays bishop to d7, things can get really, really wild after it takes and then takes. And then I believe I was calculating uh, queen takes b7. And if uh, actually the king doesn't really have a great place to go, if it moves back, I take the rook with check. It has to move, looks like it has to move forward, but if king digs e6, I can castle, threatening knight c4 with a triple fork. If queen digs d2, I, uh, I have rook d1. Of course, with bishop a1, I have knight c4. So black would have to play knight c7 here, and then the position would just be complete chaos, uh, spending a lot of time calculating deeply into this position after takes, 
um, I believe my calculation was bishop takes e7 and then castling. And maybe white's not winning immediately, but it looks really good for white uh, given the king's on d7, bishop's pinned. The knight is still untakeable because of rook d1 ideas, knight c4 is coming. So I was hoping we would go into a line like this, but uh, we didn't. And she played the move king to f8 here, which should be the best move in the position. I took back, and then she played a move that I had overlooked, is bishop to d7. And I overlooked this move because it looks like, oh, it's just a free bishop, except my bishop on b5 is still pinned to the e5 pawn. And uh, then I realized I do have some issues to solve because my bishop's attacked twice and pinned. My knight is also pinned, so black weirdly has some nice peace harmony uh, happening in this position. Um, I decided to take on e7 with check first. Why not take a pawn and force black to bond cloud in the middle game? And then I played the move bishop to e2, which uh, attempts to just cover my bases. I ensure that if black takes on e5, it wouldn't be check. And uh, she didn't end up taking on e5 in the game. If she does, I would happily castle and have prospects of rookie one, and it would be an interesting position to play. Um, not to mention b7 is also hanging here. So we got to this position, and she played the move bishop to c6, which I think is very reasonable. It defends b7, hits g2, and I still can't castle uh, because my king is tied down to defending the knight. So I played a centralizing move, queen to e3, over defending the knight, also uh, defending the pawn on e5, and also making it so g2 is, uh, is a poison pawn because then I would have queen g5 check to pick up the bishop in this position. So I thought queen e3 was a really nice multi-purpose move, but she kept applying pressure here, played the move rook hd8, which adds another uh, attacker to the knight on d2, and now I'm still tied down. Now both my queen and king are tied down to defending the pin knight. So I over-defend the knight yet again with rook d1. Uh, she hits a rook with bishop a4. I play rook b1, uh, hitting the pawn. And then she returns to c6. And this brings us to a very critical position, which in the moment I thought I was still better, and uh, I thought I should be the one playing for an advantage. Um, now, of course, I could play rook d1, and this would just repeat the position. And if I played this move, it would be very likely that we would just end up drawing after bishop a4, repeat, repeat. And um, after the game, according to my analysis and the engine analysis, I should have gone for the repetition. The problem was I overestimated my chances and I thought I could still uh, play for more uh, with the move rook to b2. This turned out to be a uh, big mistake, and we're going to see why. Now, I do defend the knight, and I make it so my rook can't really be attacked by, uh, by light's word bishop. But she played a really sensational move here, which during the game I thought was a blunder. She played the move bishop takes g2. And I, I addressed earlier that this pawn should be poisonous because of queen g5 check. It turns out black is more than happy to sacrifice the piece here. After what happened in the game, uh, queen g5, she played king f8, I took the bishop, and then, uh, then black takes on e5. And even though I have an extra bishop in this position, my pieces are really, really badly placed. Uh, my king's still in the center, bishop is pinned to the king, the rook's on pre, and... Uh, I know it, it looks like I can take on b7, but this would walk into a lot of issues. Um, in the game, I was scared of knight c5 hitting the rook, also knight d3 ideas. Uh, turns out there's an even stronger move, rook takes d2, and engine says black is completely winning here after king takes d2, rook d8, and if bishop d3, there's knight c5. And even though white's up a rook, uh, there's just too much initiative for black in this position. So uh, so the position was difficult. Um, I saved my rook with uh, rook to b5. 
And I should mention that we were only on move 25 and I was already getting into time trouble. Actually, we were both getting quite low on time. So the next several moves from both of us had to be played with very little time. Uh, she played the move queen c3, keeping my knight pinned and uh, now also attacked twice. I played rook to d5, trying to trade and neutralize a little bit. But then she found a really nice move, knight to c7, which uh, simply attacks a rook and forces me to move the rook somewhere. And there's really not a great square to move the rook to. I essentially have to take on d8, and this trades off my only active piece. She takes back, and now my position is just in shambles. Uh, my pieces are super, super passive. An extra bishop for me doesn't really mean much in this position. Um, and sadly, I did have to give back some material. I castled here. Um, I will point out, I do have a move queen to g5 to try and defend the knight, but this doesn't quite work tactically after queen c1, forcing bishop d1, and then rook d8. And uh, yeah, I'm just losing more material because the king has to move, and I lose a bishop, and this is just losing for white. So tried to cut my losses with castling. She took on d2. I took on b7. And I was still hopeful that maybe I could hold the endgame just because I'm, I'm only down a pawn. And even though my bishop's hanging, I do counterattack the knight. And we did end up trading the minor pieces. Unfortunately, after queen to g4, I had to go into an endgame uh, the move I wanted to play is king h1, but this just loses to queen f3, king g1, and then a move like rook d5, and um, yeah, black just has a, a deadly mating attack. So had to play the move queen g3, and after takes, takes, a uh, very precise move here from black, rook to d3. And I'm down a pawn, but on top of that, black is having a really active rook, and I'm having a very passive rook. Had to defend the pawn with rook a1. Uh, not the type of move you want to play in a rook ending. I will note here that uh, if I go for a4, black would just win the pawn with rook a3. And it'd just be losing for white. So I played rook a1. And we are on move 33 here. So we both had just a couple minutes left um, still to, to reach move 40. On move 40, we both got extra half hour, so the game still lasted a, a while longer. Um, a5 was played, a4, rook d4, king g2. And even though maybe the position still looks like there's some chances to hold for white, I will say right now that uh, her endgame technique was just flawless. And uh, as we're going to see, Black just converted this position with, uh, with ease. And uh, I think it's very instructive just to show how to use one extra pawn and an active rook to, to win a position like this. So I want to um, just show the next few moves and point out the, the overall strategy for Black. Um, she was in no rush, started with h5, uh, just gaining space on the king side, improving the king. I was stuck just sitting with my rook, and there was really no great way to improve the position for white. Played king e3, rook found a happy place on b4. I had to keep waiting, black kept improving. f6, rook a1. And essentially the plan for black was to optimize the pawns, uh, get the king to a more active square, and then have the idea to either walk up on the king side, either get into f3, or walk all the way over to b4 and win the, the a pawn. So we'll see how this plays out. I played rook h1, she played king g6, okay, some repeating, and then pawn h4. Uh, nice move just to, to simplify a little bit. Uh, defend, takes, and takes. And now after king f7, the king has a very clear path and unfortunately, my king is cut off on the fourth rank. I would really like to try and get counterplay, but uh, counterplay just didn't exist for white in this position. King f3, king e6. Um, my strategy was to, to try and follow her king, to basically move my king to whatever file her king was on. Uh, but we'll see that doesn't quite work out. She played the move rook f4. I played f3, and then king d5. And now uh, I can't play king 
to d3 because that would lose a pawn and a rook. And if I play king to d2, then uh, black can very simply play king c4, king c2, king b4. And if I play king b2, then a move like g4 is just lights out for me because um, my pawn is pinned at f2 square by just losing this position. So instead of uh, king d2, I played rook to b3, uh, realizing that maybe now's the time to sack the pawn and try and get my rook active. But really anything I do is, is losing. Uh, she took the pawn. I got my rook to f6. I was really hoping for a move like rook f4 so I can get rook b5 in and swindle my way to a draw. But she played king e5, and now I'm down two pawns. Um, and as we go forward, black kept making progress. Zooming through here, kept making progress. Eventually I lost the my, my beloved f-pawn. Now she can't take right away because I would take, maybe there'd still be some chances, but played the move rook a2, king g1, king g3, threatening maiden 1, played king f1, and black won f-pawn. Now, I didn't resign in this position because I still had one more trick, which I did get to try during the game. Uh, so as we'll see, rook takes a4, rook b3. Um, just trying to survive here. Black's pawns start marching. I play king h1, f3, rook g1, king f4, king h2, g4. And this is where I get to try my one last trick. I played the move rook to b1, um, trying to make it seem like a mouse slip, maybe trying to intend that I played rook a1. Uh, but after I played this move, I shouted out, oh no, my rook, except I didn't shout it out um, because we were in a, a library and you're not supposed to shout in a library. And uh, of course, if she takes a rook, I would be absolutely euphoric if, if this actually happened. But uh, sadly, it didn't. She threw in the move g3 check, and I threw in the towel in this position. Because after king h3, then black can take the rook, and it's no longer stalemate, and it would be checkmate. So that wraps up the game. Um, it was a really interesting fight. Uh, the opening, the middle game, the end game, I think there were so many things to learn at the various stages uh, throughout the game. I know there are a lot of complicated and funny lines uh, throughout the game, and it can be hard when recapping these games to be super thorough uh, with analysis. So if you do have any questions or comments, leave them below, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. So stay tuned.